everyone, the September 7, 2018 edition of Colorado Inside Out. I'm your host, Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's get a quick take on Colorado Attorney General Cynthia Kaufman joining other states in filing a lawsuit against Purdue Pharma, producers of OxyContin, claiming it ignited Colorado's opioid crisis. Patty Calhoun from Westward, uh, perhaps I'm being cynical, but th this lawsuit seems a little far-fetched to me. But what do you think? Well, she's joined in the state's lawsuit. Denver has, is looking at the city's lawsuits. Similar. I might be missing something, but the point is these are legal drugs. That's why the drug company is making them, and they are prescribed by doctors. I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on TV, but there are other people involved in this who are responsible. I would much prefer that the AGs take their time and energy and push medical marijuana as an alternative across the country, make sure it's secure for people who want a much safer alternative for pain medication. Krista Kafer, columnist of the Denver Post, thanks for joining us. Uh, you know, this seems like a nonpartisan issue to me. Even though Cynthia Kaufman is a Republican AG, it doesn't seem like all the Republican AGs involved. Um, is it a nonpartisan issue? I would say it's nonpartisan, but I also would say it's misplaced. I mean, where's the discussion about personal responsibility? I've had to take Oxy. I've had what, five surgeries in 10 years. Uh, OxyContin made those surgeries possible for me. It made my dad's cancer journey a little bit easier. It, uh, I've seen people go off of these things too. It's, it's difficult to get off, but there's a personal responsibility element that no one's discussing. That if you take these drugs uh, for surgery or for an event or for chronic pain, you have a responsibility to monitor, monitor your intake. And if you get addicted, you need to find ways to get off of those pills. What concerns me about these lawsuits is what if it makes it more expensive and more difficult to get pills when you actually need them? Penfield Tate, attorney with QTAC Rock, also a longtime state lawmaker. Uh, as our esteemed attorney at the table, uh, what chances do you give this lawsuit? You know, it's hard to handicap, Dominic, because it, there's the legal theory and there's sort of the, the common sense way you look at these things. Uh, the legal theory is that uh, the, the manufacturer was engaged in fraudulent marketing um, and advertising practices and deceptive. And, and I don't know how that works when I think the whole universe knows that these drugs are potentially addictive and, and they're prescribed by a doctor and patients have to regulate what they're taking. So I don't quite figure out, I can't understand the theory behind it. And, and I guess part of it is it depends on which jury you get um, and, and who's hearing it. So we'll see what happens. But I, I think the lawsuits are kind of misplaced for that reason. Ed C. Lever, reporter of the Denver Business Journal. Uh, Ed, I can tell you this, if this is successful, uh, Frank Azar and I are taking on Nabisco and Oreos because this was not my fault. <laughs> so, uh, Ed, as you look at this, should other drug makers be worried? Not yet. I think what you see is that local cities, uh, states across the country are going after Purdue right now. They're the biggest face on the opioid crisis. Uh, and they're kind of testing the waters here. If we see a big settlement coming from Purdue or if we see a, a court case go against Purdue, then yes, I think other drug makers should be worried. Uh, I also am very curious what's gotten into Cynthia Kaufman here. She wasn't a real activist AG in early on in her term. Now that she's ending the, uh, the term, she's gotten a lot more into ideas like this. Tonight we kicked off the debate season at 7 p.m. with a debate featuring both sides of Amendment 73, a ballot measure that would increase education funding. If you missed it, go to cpt12.org. It's very informative. Since the ballot becomes official today, let's do a round on how the ballot issues may affect the general election here in Colorado. Patty, uh, there are a lot of issues in the statewide ballot. The Denver ballot, which is also finalized, is even bigger. It's going to take people a long time to get through it. Will the ballot issues on all these in these different communities be the tail that wags the dog that is the general election? Well, the ballot issues are certainly going to be responsible for adding to the opioid crisis because you cannot look at those ballots without needing a painkiller. The, there are 13 measures on the Colorado ballot. They're all very confusing, except for maybe the one that says we should ban the use of the word slavery in the Constitution. But that didn't pass the last time it was up. All of them are tricky. When you talk about 73, that would amend the Constitution, which we all are concerned about. Every time that happens, it makes it hard to undo. And it's as complicated as 66 was, maybe worse. It's really tough to understand. And all of these are hard. You've got the transportation being pushed by Chamber of Commerce, countered by a transportation measure, Independence Institute. You have the fracking setback of 2,500 feet, countered by the property rights, um, the kind of the takings issue that's pushed by the Farm Bureau. 
So there's a side, they're not exact opposite either, so you really need to study through them. And while we're studying through all of them and deciding maybe you can really get behind one or really against another, which will urge people to vote, maybe they will also actually pay attention to the candidates, the many, many candidates running for public office in November. Krista, speaking of all those uh, candidates running in November, do you think any of those races will be swayed by their stances on all these ballot issues? I think it's certainly possible. In fact, the people who put the initiatives on the ballot are aware that it drives votes one way or the other. I'm not a big fan of the initiative process. I think we have legislators for this reason. There's a lot, as Patty was saying, a lot of complications, a lot of costs, a lot of benefits. We actually hire people to weigh those out. They're called legislators. So hopefully while folks are showing up for the ballot initiatives, they actually vote for the people who should be making those decisions. Penn, as a former state legislator, you made a lot of decisions like this, but let me ask you about a general election, the political oxygen in the room. And what I mean by that is that there's only a certain amount of ad time, a certain amount of space in newspapers and websites and even Twitter feeds for everything. And at some point, if you have this huge ballot, there's not gonna be enough room to talk about everything. Do you think something's gonna slip through the cracks because we're not gonna know much about it? Yeah, I think most things will slip through the cracks. And, and I think, I, li I like your analogy. There, there's only so much oxygen in the room, it gets taken up by all these issues and candidates. And I think what happens is people begin to ignore all of it on a massive level. Um, they begin to ignore all of the TV commercials, except the really nasty ones that for some reason have some staying power. They tend to ignore all of the mailers. Um, I, I watch people, when they get their mail, they get the, the mailers, half of it goes right in the trash. They never look at it. Um, and so, and when they get the ballot and they see how massive it is, you know, I, I believe that, that voters look for particular things they're interested in, they vote on those, and the rest of it, it's a crapshoot, how they're gonna vote. And when in doubt, they just vote no on everything else, and that's part of the problem we have. You know, the bigger issue, and, and this is a conversation for another day, is, is I do believe that Tabor has had a, a dramatic impact on how representative democracy works in Colorado. Uh, because of Tabor, legislators have frankly gotten frightened of the initiative process, and because of the various, you know, voter requirements, so that a number of issues that legislators ought to be deciding, as Krista talked about, they punt on, because they feel it's safer just to give it to the voters rather than make a tough decision themselves. Ed, with the size of the ballot and the magnitude of the races, and the statewide races are a big deal, they bring in a lot of money themselves, should some of these ballot issues worry about getting enough face time? I think they should, and I think they should worry about competing against each other, even in ways that Patty didn't point out there. Um, she points out, rightly, that you have a, a tax hike for roads, and you have a, a non-tax hike, bond sale for roads. But I think in many ways, the tax hike for roads that the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce is putting out there is also competing against the education tax hike. I mean, we as Coloradans haven't approved a statewide tax hike since 2004, and that was on cigarettes, don't forget. Um, so uh, are we really going to be in the mood to approve two of them this year? Or are people going to go to that ballot and say, what do I care more about, education or roads? I mean, and frankly, if they have to decide between the two, they're both going to fail. Um, yeah, I, I think these ballot initiatives really need to worry about getting out there. I think that the down-ballot candidates need to step up their games, too. Um, if you are running for AG or Treasurer or Secretary of State and you don't want to just be voted on as the, oh, am I voting for a D or an R, then you ought to really work to get your message out there because otherwise people are going to forget you're even on the ballot until you show up this year. Uh, I, I do worry, uh, as everyone's mentioned, about voters being fatigued and not digging into these issues enough. Um, but that happens every two years, and yet somehow we still have representative democracy. If you're worried about learning more about the ballot issues on this year's ballot, Colorado Public Television, as always, has you covered every Friday night at 7 o'clock from this Friday all the way through Election Day, we're going to have a half-hour debate at 7 o'clock featuring the ballot issues in September and then some of the statewide races and even CD6 in October. So be sure to tune in. Like you said, like I said earlier, the education debate is already on our website. Next week at 7 p.m., we have both transportation issues. John Caldera and Kelly Bruff join us in the studio. Very educational and even some entertaining parts of that if a, if a debate can be entertaining. Let's get to the next topic. Residents in the Swansea and Elyria neighborhoods may endure even louder construction noise if the contractor's request for noise variance is approved. Kiewit, who also was the contractor for the T-Rex project in south, the south part of I-25, is asking for higher allowances at night and no limits during some daytime bridge demolition. Krista, I really feel for the residents in Elyria and Swansea. They really, from the point I-70 went through, those neighborhoods have 
really been getting uh, the, the desperately short end of the stick. But to endure even uh, louder noise during uh, night, they said, I think I remember reading it was 80 decibels, which um, was the alarm clock. That's all night long. That's not even the, the, the no limits uh, that would happen during the day. Do the residents in these neighborhoods have a shot at getting any sleep for the next four years? I think it's going to be tough, and I am sympathetic to the people who live there. But we also have to remember that demolition is noisy. There's no way to get around that. What the board ended up doing is giving them a, a one-year variance. So they actually have to go back and reapply. That means that they have to make sure that they fulfill their promises to the neighborhood, whether it's hotel vouchers or fixing up homes so that they are less loud. It's, uh, there's a little bit of an accountability measure, uh, measure there, but I also appreciate the fact that this work is loud, and to get it done, and to get it done in a timely way, it's going to have to be loud. Penn, uh, as an attorney, uh, as a formal civil servant, are the folks in Larry and Swansea just in for a miserable four years? I, I, I think they are. I, I mean, this part of, part of this neighborhood is an area I represented when I was in the Senate, and I went to the hearing yesterday. I was curious to see uh, how the board was going to receive this, a and they did sort of take a half measure in terms of approving just a year to see how it works out, but the bottom line is um, these neighborhoods are going to be hugely impacted for theoretically a convenience of a bunch of other people. Uh, and, and I do believe that the way this is all played out politically at the city and state level, they've pretty much been ignored. And, and there's a whole environmental justice issue here because these are neighborhoods that are predominantly um, minority and, and poor. And, and people just aren't that concerned. And, and I don't know, I was talking with someone the other last night about it and said, how would you feel if someone told you, pack up your stuff and move into a hotel for three days because the construction is going to be right next to your house? I, I don't know if I'd be very happy about that. Ed, is, do you think from what we've seen from Kiwit as the contractor, which did the T-Rex project and had similar noise issues and walls, all that kind of good stuff, uh, is this a track record that... I guess the general citizenry in Denver can uh, have hope that something's going to be done, or is it a poor track record? Well, I mean, they can very much look at the T-Rex project and decide, and, and there are various opinions about that. Uh, I was not here during most of the construction of that, so I, I can't weigh in on that. Um, but I will tell you this, the general citizenry of Denver uh, and general citizenry period led to this. And, and here's what I mean by that, is that you've heard two things over the years about these construction projects. Um, one is that they're awfully expensive. We need to find some way uh, to bring them in on time, or to bring them in on cost. And second, is that they drag too long. We need to find some way to bring them in on time. So governments have come up with the idea of public-private partnerships, which is exactly what the Central 70 Project is. It's a deal with Kiwit Meridian um, where they are going to be assuming some of the risk. And in fact, if they come in late, it's their financing that's going to get chipped on this. They're not going to get paid if they come in late on this. And so in order to speed up the work as the citizens have asked for, they've said, okay, we're going to need to work through the night. And that's how we're going to stay on time. And that's how we're going to make our money. So theoretically, everyone has complained about the efficiency and the cost of these projects. Public-private partnerships are a way of dealing with the efficiency and the cost. Here's the blowback, is that businesses are going to act like businesses and they're going to make sure it gets done and they're thinking about how to get done, not about the surrounding neighborhood quite as much. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a catch-22 in all honesty, but this is what people should be thinking about when they think, how do we get here? Patty, you've had personal experience with crazy construction of a highway uh, near your house. What do you, uh, do you have any advice for the residents in Swansea and Elyria? Airplugs, airplugs. Um, they actually offered my neighborhood, um, the CDOT offered uh, hotel places, which we didn't take at the time. But it does get really loud. We know this, but that was for a night. These guys are going to go through it for at least a year. They, they knew it was coming. That's why you've had so many neighbors fight it. On the other hand, the, that smaller neighborhood against all of Denver, and not just Denver, Coloradans and other people traveling who want this project to be done faster so they're able to co go through on I-70 faster, that's a hard will of the people to go against. But there have been some really tone-deaf things, like CDOT had a happy art, uh, art project on the elementary school that is right up against the highway painting murals to make people happy and maybe drown out some of the sound. And some of the artists backed out just because they thought they were art washing a really bad project. Walker Stapleton spokesperson told Nine News this week that the candidate was joking when he called Westward and the Colorado Independent phony news organizations at a fundraiser last week. Stapleton's comments were made at a private event in Parker where he was joined by Tom Tancredo, a former member of this esteemed table. Uh, Penn, uh, this, the the candidate already said he was joking, 
It was a private event, uh, but it's 2018. Is anything really private unless you're in the cone of silence a la Get Smart? Uh, what do you make of the situation? Well, it's not private if you're a candidate running for governor and the private event is to promote your candidacy to be the next governor of the state of Colorado. And so anything you say is always on the record and you may call it a joke, but at best it's a joke in poor taste and particularly given the context. We've talked about the whole tribalism and what's happening in this country now. And the reality is this, and we've talked about it here before, to have a functioning democracy, you've got to have a vital, free, and independent press. That's why it's the First Amendment, not the 31st Amendment. And it, it really bothers me when Donald Trump continually attacks the press, rather than just stepping up and saying, yeah, I said it, I did it, okay, fine let's move on, or, or providing an explanation, you, you go after the messenger, and the messenger is not at fault here. And I'm, I'm a little disturbed if Walker's beginning to slide down this path, and even if Jared Polis slides down this path and starts accusing the press for saying, you know, I was misquoted when you tape recorded the interview or something, or several people heard it, you weren't misquoted, or I misspoke. Well, you may have misspoken, but don't blame the press for catching you saying something dumb. But there's a dangerous environment being created. And I'm just really concerned that Colorado politicians, particularly folks running for the highest office in the state, are beginning to take the tact and approach of Donald Trump because we see where that's taken this country and, quite frankly, the world. Ed, are we going to begin to see non disclosure agreements at fundraiser events? <laughs> you, you know, we've gotten to the point where I think uh, while everyone tends to focus on Trump and Penn makes good points about that um, I think candidates of all sides have begun to see the press as the enemy at this point and that's because the more they can get in front of people and instead of just 30 second spot on TV these days they can get in front of social media they can continue to use mailers they can get in front of a lot of ways they want to control the message the more that they lose control of that message the more they become uh, uh, functioning as, as a fighter against the people who are putting that message out there. Uh, it, it's worth noting that, yeah, this was Walker uh, kind of going after two organizations. He's not alone in this race in doing this. I can go all the way back to 2009 after the Rocky Mountain News closed when Jared Polis spoke to a group of bloggers and said that we, speaking of the tech entrepreneur community, uh, killed the Rocky Mountain News and, quote, I argue it's mostly for the better. The media is dead. Long live the new media. So it's not like Jared Polis is particularly friendly and saying, oh, what a terrible thing you've said, Walker, here. Uh, I think this is, this is the kind of rhetorical level we've gotten to at this point. Uh, candidates uh, also want to focus on what they want rather than, say, the issues. Uh, we're, we're dealing with that repeatedly in this race now. I'll tell you, I went to an uh, event at 11 o'clock today that was billed as a, uh, a talk about Polis's pro-worker agenda, which sounded something very uh, interesting to the business community. All it was was people standing in Walker Stapleton's empty parking spot asking where Walker was. So, you know, when, when, when people bash the media after they invite us somewhere under you know seemingly false pretenses uh, they should think about uh, why we might be critical or why we might uh, say something they don't like so um, but I, I don't think this is the last time we're gonna see that uh, in this campaign Patty a phony news organization I'm not sure even registers on the offense meter for Westward even called far worse oh, by myself <laughs> <laughs> your, your reaction to the the joking event well hold on to your socks because I actually thought it was fairly funny and it was I was gratified to see that a candidate for governor of Colorado could quit being such a stiff or a scaredy cat which Walker Stapleton certainly was when an editor dared to introduce herself to him at a public gathering you know I thought okay they already knew there was a reporter there Corey Hutchins from the Independent was lurking in the was in the bushes because they wouldn't let him in so he had to stay off the property so they knew a reporter was there he made what I'm assuming is a joke with people listening, and it, I listened to the tape. It was kind of funny. I've, I've certainly said worse things about Westward and worse things about Walker Stapleton. But the concern I have is that other people don't think this is a joke. I can tell you the kinds of threats and the kinds of nasty things that are said to us all the time now. It's OK because of Trump. It's OK because of other people. It is not OK to threaten the media who are really out there doing their job because they want to be representatives of the people and these people who want elected office should be willing to talk to the representatives of the people. Krista, a tempest in a teapot? 
It's a tempest in a teapot, seriously. It's, my reaction to the story is who cares? I, I don't like it when politicians put down the media even in jest, but still it's not a real story. I mean, what really matters between Jared Polis and Walker Stapleton is where they stand on the issues. Anything about you know, who said what, you know, who was standing with Tom Tancredo, none of that really matters. What really matters is what they believe and what they're going to do. I adore your idealism. I, if, <laughs> if we could have an election based on uh, <laughs> what people stand on, on issues, that would be wonderful. But I'm not sure if we're going to get there. The Aspen Skiing Company announced this week their new Give a Flake campaign, letting people know whether the congressional representatives are pro or anti-climate and ask them to con uh, contact them either to thank them or chastise them for their votes. Uh, the author of this story, I want to give credit for the, the words I even just read right here, Ed Sealever, this is a part of your work in Denver Business Journal, uh, Aspen taking a stand in a marketing campaign, uh, unique, new, it's new to the extent that we're seeing that this year. I mean, Aspen last year came out with its Aspen Values campaign. We're talking about unity and taking a stand on something. And frankly, we've seen surveys showing that, especially among millennials, more than half of them want to uh, buy products from a company that stand for something, that take a stand on something. But it's a really interesting move to see them go this political during an election year. And I think it's a lot about the times we're in, uh, to feel like they can attract people to the mountain by saying, look, we not only want you to come and ski, here, we want you to tell your representatives to preserve our climate and preserve our winters because that's where we stand. Uh, the folks at Aspen said, yeah, we, we expect some sort of backlash, but not a lot. They think it's a very existential crisis to their industry. If it stops snowing, they're not going to be able to advertise anything to these folks. Um, but I think it'll be very interesting to see the reaction, and this is certainly not quite the Nike Colin Kaepernick campaign we're talking about there, but everyone I talked to for this story analogize it to that, that people are now willing to take these bigger stands because of the heightened times we're in when people want to hear about these issues, not just about the things they can do for fun. So it'll be very interesting to see the reaction they get in the coming weeks and months here. Patty, surprised to see a stance out of Aspen Skiing Company? No, because it's really playing off what they started last year. There are so many ski areas, not just in Colorado, but around the country, you have to differentiate yourself somehow. And Aspen already has a status level. It's a little hard to argue about climate when it's not like people can walk to Aspen. It, you, there is absolutely no way you can get there that does not consume a lot of energy before you even hit the slopes. Uh, Krista, the people who go skiing at Aspen probably has as diverse opinion on anything, especially when it comes to climate change. Uh, is this marketing campaign new Coke, or who cares? You know, in a way, it's kind of a who cares. It's, it's obviously posturing. It's not actually going to do anything for the environment. You've got rich people flying in from California, leaving their 10,000-square-foot house to hang out in their 10,000-square-foot uh, guest house uh, on their private jet. I mean, this is about rich people feeling a little bit better about their decisions and you know that's fine but I don't think it's actually going to do anything for uh, the global warming crisis. Penn wrap it up for us. Well it, I, I don't think it makes a big difference with regard to Aspen but to, to Ed's bigger point when you see what Aspen's doing when you see what Nike's doing I think we're, we're entering into an era and maybe this whole tribalism is driving this in, in terms of companies wanting to establish some sort of higher ground uh, in the in the context of social responsibility, that we're more than just a ski company. We're a ski company that promotes green things, or we're more than just a sneaker company. We're a sneaker company that supports or vindicates the the civil rights of African American men. Or, so I, I think we're going to see more of that, um, and it's going to be an interesting trend. It may be nauseating. <laughs> no. <laughs> we, we've been called uh, that ourselves here at uh, Cardo Inside Out, so uh, we'll see. It remains to be seen. It's time for our very favorite part of the show, Disgrace of the Week. Patty, as always, please start us off. David Ross, a Boulder County candidate for the State House who took the uh, enemy of the people line joke a little too seriously. And in fact, when we contacted him this week to ask him about his very anti Semitic, racist blog, he uh, said he did not talk to enemies of the people, i.e. the press. Well, he withdrew yesterday from the race, and that's good for Boulder County. Krista. You know, I'm going to give disgrace of the week to Senator Bennett uh, for grandstanding during the Kavanaugh nomination hearings. He was like, you know, there's not enough paperwork. There's not enough information. There's like four, 400,000 you know, pieces of paper that, that they needed to go over. That's, I think, more than the last five SCOTUS nomination hearings. They have enough. They're just trying to delay. 
I always wonder what the poor printer is like at the, at, the uh, at Congress, just printing out. You hear these thousands of pages of things. Just some poor guy at Kinko's just suffering. <laughs> uh, Penn, your disgrace of the week. Um, related to, to Krista's point, actually, Senate Republicans, when you give somebody 400,000 pages of documents, you need to give them time to read them. And so I think part of the request to delay the confirmation hearings and put it off a period of days was reasonable. If you expect it to have a full vetting and if you give people information as part of the vetting process, they ought to have a fair opportunity to review the material. Ed, time to bring it. I'm going to stick with the Senate confirmation hearings, but I'm going to throw both sides under the bus here. There's been a lot of talk about, hey, we should have these records, uh, Brad Kavanaugh's records, be uh, public. Um, well, here's the problem with that. They could easily have been public if Congress would amend the Freedom of Information Act so we could actually get their emails like we can with any other public official's emails. However, since Senator Cory Booker and those who say we need more full disclosure haven't gone to that length yet, we in the public are left out of this while they have this information. Hardest part of the show, time to say something nice about somebody. Patty? I feel like a phony compared to Ed Marston, the wonderful publisher of High Country News, the publication that he and his wife Betsy really grew into an incredible force in the West. He passed away this week. If you want to look at a real friend of the people, look at what he and High Country News continue to do. Krista. Okay, it's kind of dorky and sciencey, but I want to give a shout out to the University of Colorado and the biologists there that are going to revive a certain cutthroat species that was thought to be extinct. Hey, good job, guys. You hear cutthroat trout's great. Yeah, both great. Um, a shout out to um, Boulder um, and the 14.2 million renovation of Scott Carpenter Park, built to commemorate a homegrown astronaut and a place where I spent many a summer day in the park and in the pool um, having fun. So glad to see they're going to spruce it up a bit. Ed. You may say the Coors family did a lot to promote their brand, but nobody ever promoted it better than Burt Reynolds, who made us all want to drive across the country and get Coors Light when we couldn't. Rest in peace, Burt. Here, here. A quick reminder, we kicked off the election season earlier tonight at 7 p.m. with Colorado Decides and Both Sides of the Story. That's our high school debate series. Every Friday from this week through Election Day, we'll have two debates to keep you informed. Be sure to check them out. For everyone here at Colorado Public Television, I'm Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you very much for watching.